Well, today natural science teaches that the earth is 4.6 billion years old, but uh, the biblical history contains dates that only allow for an age of just about 6,000 years. That's a pretty significant difference. But before you put too much stock into the scientific age of the earth, you may, uh, you may have noted this year that the age of the universe doubled. Up until before this year, the age of the universe was stated to be 13.7 billion years old. And this year, the state age of the universe suddenly doubled to 26.7 billion years old. So I don't think science has their dating uh, worked out as well as they, uh, they uh, like to claim. Well, to examine this subject, the subject of the age of the earth, I will first summarize the various views on the biblical age of creation and discuss why this issue is important for Bible believers. We're going to look then at a number of physical measurements that place upper limits on the age of the earth and show conclusively that the earth simply cannot be billions of years old. When the scientific findings are examined, we find there is overwhelming proof for a recent creation. First, to answer the question as to why we should care, well, the age of the earth is central to the debate over creation versus evolution because deep time is not supported by the Bible and is a theoretical necessity for evolution. Today, atheism dominates academia, and as a result, more and more Christians are adopting philosophical naturalism. Many simply do not recognize that secular science is attempting to explain how everything came into existence through purely natural processes. Whether that's the cosmos or earth or life on earth, they hold to philosophical naturalism. A non-biblical natural history of our world is being taught today by academics and scientists as though it's an established fact, effectively degrading the reliability of Scripture in the public mind. And we need to call them for what they are, false teachings, which are in direct conflict with the Bible. Well, due to the evangelistic way that evolution is taught in schools, t today, sadly, many Christians have come to believe these false teachings and adopt what would be called a theistic evolutionary worldview. They believe in God, so they're theists, and they believe in evolution, so they're evolutionists. We call them theistic evolutionists. Well, there are several important historical events in Genesis that are contested by people holding to theistic evolution due to the conflict that they have with natural history. These include the creation account, the flood, a great many of the miracles in the Bible, and the Garden of Eden. Many views have been put forward by forcing interpretations into Scripture, a hermeneutic that essentially reflects where one places the author their authority of truth. Do we place our truth with the Word of God or with man's philosophical views that are falsely called science? Well, it's often argued by theistic evolutionists, which also are often called the old earth creationists, that the difference between their view and the young earth view is simply a matter of an interpretation of Scripture, specifically the days of creation and the genealogical record. But this is simply not true. Both do offer important support for a recent creation, but they are not the main point of contention. For instance, using the genealogy of Adam to Noah shown here from Genesis 5, the date of the flood can be easily calculated by adding up the ages when the patriarchs gave birth. When doing this, we find that the flood of Noah occurred in the year 1656, Anno Mundi, the year of the world. Using additional genealogies and historical content, the year of the flood, 1656, has been determined to correspond to approximately 2348 B.C., with the creation occurring in the year 4004 B.C. We add that to today's date, 2024. It gives us a current age of the creation of about 6,028 years. While it is true that there are minor differences between the genealogies in Genesis and Chronicles, the differences we are talking about is on the order of several billion years, not a few dozen. The truth is the difference between the old earth and the young earth view is based on an interpretation of the earth, not scripture, specifically the fossil record. 
It is without question that the overwhelming majority of theologians throughout history have held to a young earth view based on the teachings of Scripture alone. By contrast, modern theistic evolutionists accept the teachings of natural science as fact, including their interpretation of fossiliferous rock and their proposed age of the earth, which is based on the fossil record. They presume that the teachings of natural science regarding the fossil record are true and interpret the Bible within this axiom. Natural science claims that the earth is 4.6 billion years old, and they tout radiometric dating as proof of this. But one thing we need to be very clear on, ladies and gentlemen, is that rocks do not come with tags saying how old they are. An ancient earth is a theoretical necessity for the theory of, of evolution. Evolution through random mutation and natural selection requires long periods of time, and as a result, natural science is interpreting and cherry-picking data in support of their view on how the earth evolved. The fact is, though, there are hundreds of natural processes that can be used to determine the upper limit on the age of creation, and more than 90% of them conflict with the idea that the earth is old and, and support an earth that's much less than a billion years of age required for evolution. But what about those days of creation that are mentioned in Genesis? The other main point of contention between old earth creationism and young earth creationism some argue, some of the old earth creationists will argue that there's a huge gap of time, literally the entire 26 billion year age of the universe. They say there's a huge gap of time during the first day of creation, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, where it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then they say, and then the earth was without form and void and darkness over the face of the deep. They say there's a huge gap of time right there. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that there was a whole history of the earth there. Satan fell, the fossil record was developed, and then the earth became, they would say, that should be interpreted without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And then God recreated things on top of this pre-existing fossil record. That's what they call the gap theory. Another view is to claim that the, the word day in Genesis 1 must not mean an ordinary solar day, but instead means a vast age of time. Billions of years each, perhaps. Well, this day-age view seems to work unless you look a little more closely at the sequence of days and you find some serious problems with either Big Bang cosmology or biological evolution. For example, looking at this graphic, the sun, moon, and stars weren't created until day four. But that's a big problem for plants that are created on day three, if each of those days is like a billion years each. We also see, uh, and, and the fact that sun and moon and stars aren't created until day four is a huge uh, conflict with Big Bang cosmology. Because according to the Big Bang, after a long dark period, the first things that would have evolved would have been your stars. And after eons of time, billions of years of star births and star deaths, enough of the heavy elements would have been cooked up to form dust particles, which would accrete into ever larger particles, and eventually you have solar systems form. But solar systems would have come a long time after star births. Then you look at the animals that are created on day five and six. There's a problem there, too. Uh, the Bible says that flying creatures and sea creatures were created on day five. But according to biological evolution, birds evolved from reptiles, from land animals. And the aquatic mammals also evolved from land animals. So those are out of sequence as well. Well, oddly, and perhaps not surprisingly, Genesis 1 is the only place in Scripture where the meaning of the word day is in question. And it is clear that this is due to modern scientific assertions that the earth is much older than the Bible states. In fact, 2,300 times the, word, the Hebrew word yom appears in the Old Testament, and its meaning is only questioned during the creation. Nevertheless, how do we know what meaning the author intended to convey? How can you tell what an author means by a word in a text? Well, there's three ways we can tell what an author means by a word, if the meaning of that word is in question. One is by context. Now, context doesn't help us really a lot in Genesis 1, but the other two ways is that the author can define the word for us, and then you can use what's called the exegetical approach to interpretation. 
These two things help us understand what the author means by the word day in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, the author very clearly defines what is meant by the word day. In Genesis 1, the author uses an odd repetition of the phrase evening and morning to make it clear to the reader that the word day means a solar day. Another important uh, note to take is, if you'll note, remember the sun and moon and stars weren't created until day four. There wasn't a solar system yet until day four. So the only reason for inserting those phrases evening and morning were to clarify what the word day means. Remember, God created time and created language and is describing the creation in terms that we can correlate with our understanding of time and definitions of time. And the author makes it very, very, very clear, oddly clear, that what is being discussed there are ordinary solar days or the lengths of time we would equate to an ordinary solar day. The other method for determining the meaning of, a, of, a, of, of, an, of an author uh, regarding a particular use of a word is what's called the exegetical approach to textual interpretation. Exegesis is also called the grammatical historical interpretation method. In exegesis, what, do you, what you do, if you're questioning what an author means by a word in one instance, you look to see how the author uses that word elsewhere in the text. You find the other instances of the author's use of that word elsewhere in the text to help inform you what the author meant in the specific case that's in question. And if we use this method, the exegetical approach to textual interpretation, we come away overwhelmingly with the interpretation that the author meant to convey the meaning that the word day, the Hebrew word yom, means an ordinary solar day. 410 times when the word day is used in plural or singular forms with a number Elsewhere in Scripture, it always means an ordinary day. 38 times outside of Genesis 1, when the words evening and morning are used together without the word day, it means an ordinary day. 23 times when the word evening and morning are used together with the word day, it means an ordinary day. 52 times the word night is used with the word day, it means an ordinary day. When critically looking at the text exegetically, One cannot come to any other conclusion except that the author meant to communicate the meaning to the reader that these were ordinary 24-hour periods of time. The only way you can interpret the Bible otherwise is to assume the supremacy of man's teachings over the Bible and force our interpretation of the world into the text. Bill Dimsky, as shown here, is a professor at Southern Evangelical Seminary and, uh, and holds to theistic evolution. Um, But he acknowledges in his book, The End of Christianity, that the young earth creation position makes the most exegetical, consistent interpretation. He says, the young earth solution to reconciling the order of creation with natural history makes good exegetical and theological sense. Indeed, the overwhelming consensus of theologians up through the Reformation held to this view. I myself, he says, would adopt it in a heartbeat, except that nature seems to present such strong evidence against it. I'm hardly alone in my reluctance to accept young earth creationism. In our modern mental environment, and informed as it is by modern astrophysics and geology, the scientific community as a whole regards young earth creationism as scientifically untenable. So if you're just using the Bible, you're going to come to a, a young earth view about the earth but if you look to the scientific community's assessment about the earth whether it's from astrophysics or geology if you let them interpret the world and you accept that interpretation is true then you will come up with the alternate meanings of the in the text and that's what is happening i mean there's two ways to reconcile the conflict that exists today between what is being taught as natural history and biblical history one is to assume the bible is true and to interpret the scientific findings ourselves consistent with the text. The other is to assume that what science is teaching about the world is true and then force that into the Bible. And sadly, that's what a lot of people do, that uh, people like Bill Dimsky. Well, not only have the overwhelming majority of theologians over the centuries held to the view that the earth is young from the biblical text alone, James Barr, a former Hebrew scholar and Ariel professor of the interpretation of Holy Scriptures at Oxford, states this, As far as I know, 
There is no Hebrew professor or Old, Old Testament... Uh, there is, as far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the idea that, one, creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. Two, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition of chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story. And three, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except for those in the ark. From the text alone, this is what you would get. If you use natural sciences views and interpretation of the world as truth, as your source of truth, then you're going to end up coming up with a lot of screwy interpretations of the Bible to force that into agreement. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the key to the young versus old earth debate is the biblical flood. Assuming the flood of Noah was a real and historical event of global proportions, then one thing is very clear. The geology of this event has been horribly misinterpreted. And this event was, in truth, responsible for forming the fossil record. An interpretation of fossiliferous rock, I will add, that has been historically assumed throughout most of human history. Let me ask this. If the flood did occur, as described in the Bible, what else would we expect to find other than what we actually find? We live on top of a flood wasteland. The earth is covered. The entire earth is covered in flood sediments that are hundreds of feet thick and laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals. In places, fossiliferous sedimentary rocks reach kilometers of thickness, like those exposed here at Canyonlands National Park or the layers exposed at Grand Canyon. There is truly a monumental body of evidence for the global flood described in the Bible more than any other historical event. There's more evidence for the global flood than any other event we can point to. And yet, today, scientists claim there's no evidence for a global flood. However, in the 1800s, natural science started arguing for a different interpretation of fossiliferous rock. And some, like Charles Lyell, a geologist back in Darwin's day, spoke of his agenda to, quote, free the science from Moses. Because, see, up until recently, everyone interpreted fossils in those layers of rocks as having been formed by the global flood. He wanted to free the science from this interpretation, and instead, they now argue that those layers of sedimentary rock were formed over vast ages, during different epochs or epochs of time, and assert that the earth is much older than the Bible states. This interpretation of, fossil, of the fossil record stands as the main observational evidence for the theory of evolution and the main physical proof that the earth is older than the Bible would allow for. But again, it's not an interpretation of the days of creation or the genealogical record that is the source of the tremendous difference in, in the biblical creation and theistic evolution views, but whether you accept natural history interpretation of fossils or the biblical view on fossils. In 2011, the American Research Group published the results of a survey of the views of faculty members of, the, of Christian colleges around the country. They interviewed the college presidents, the college vice presidents, members of the religion and science departments. 312 people were surveyed at 200 different Christian colleges in the nation. And there was one question that I want to show you. When asked, do you believe the flood was worldwide, local, or non-literal, Note that only 57% of the religion department faculty believed that the flood was a global event. 30 said it was just a local flood, and very disturbingly, 12.3% don't believe the flood was a real event at all. They're willing to completely delete multiple chapters of the Bible. I mean, the floods in Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, they're just going to delete all of those chapters and assume it was an allegorical story of some sort. <sighs> These beliefs are clearly influenced by the teachings of natural science. 
How can theologians take such a view on the flood when Jesus spoke of the flood as a real and historical event? Here in Luke 17, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when, when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And you simply cannot interpret the flood account as being a local event from the biblical text. Here from Genesis 7. And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. That's 22 and a half feet. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land whose nostrils the breath of life died. How can you get a local flood out of the description that we get in, of the flood in Genesis 6 through 9? Read it in, in, in its entirety. You cannot, get, you cannot get a local flood out of this story. It is just not possible. It says all the high mountains of the whole heavens were covered and everything on dry land and whose nostrils with the breath of life died. You cannot get a local flood out of that. But to accept natural history and reconcile that with the Bible, we have to do something. You have to do something. 